All right, well, uh, welcome back, everyone. We're nearing the end of this conference. My name is Stephen Penny. I'm a professor at the University of Alberta Faculty of Law and the chair of the Center for Constitutional Studies Advisory Board. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to serve as the moderator for, I think, the penultimate session for this conference, and that's Patriation's Impact on the Power of the State, featuring two, I think, just stellar speakers here. We've got Professor Carissima Mathen from the University of Ottawa Faculty of Law, Common Law Section, and a former professor from that same institution, now a justice of the Court of Appeal for Ontario, uh, Justice David Pachaco. So they'll speak uh, until 4.15. We'll try to reserve about 10 minutes for any questions that you might have for them. Uh, you've got their detailed bios in the, pro the conference materials, but very briefly, uh, Professor Mathen is a leading constitutional scholar, uh, as well as a scholar of the criminal law. Uh, she's written many books and is particularly, I think, noted for being an incredibly astute commentator for the media and for the public, kind of translating complex legal topics for a lay audience where she just does an incredibly stellar job. Uh, professor Pachaco, sorry, Justice Pachaco, formerly, of course, a professor of criminal law and evidence. He went on to become a justice of the Ontario Court of Justice, and then in 2017, appointed to the Court of Appeal for Ontario. Uh, and I'm particularly happy to be introducing him. He is one of my sort of scholarly heroes as a criminal uh, law professor myself, really one of the best criminal law jurists and professors that this country has ever produced. His evidence law textbook, I think, is just an absolute uh, masterpiece. Uh, so with that in mind, I'll turn it over to Carissima and David. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you for that really kind introduction. So the way that this is going to work is that I've prepared a number of questions for Justice Pachaco. And let me just say what a great honor it is to be able to have this conversation with him uh, on this topic. And so then we, we will leave some time at the end for questions. And uh, please uh, feel free to upload your questions at any time during this session. So, uh, David, I will call you David occasionally. <laughs> when, when we put out a call for papers um, for this conference, we received many proposals focusing on constitutional history, federalism, language rights, civil liberties, and we've had a number of stellar presentations on those topics. We didn't get very many on criminal law and criminal justice. And that's what motivated us to create this session. And it seems to me sometimes when we think of patriation, and even when we think of the charter, the, the criminal law, which of course, and the, the charter's impact on the power of the state, which is so important, it, it sometimes tends to fall uh, into the background uh, in, in some circles anyway. And so I guess my first question to you would, would be, just to invite you to, to describe what you see as the legacy of patriation for criminal law in Canada. Thank you, Carissima, and thank you so, so much to the organizers for inviting me. It's a, it's a real thrill to be here and to be working with uh, my colleague, Carissa Mathen and, and Professor Penny. Thank you so much, Steve, for that kind introduction. Uh, the constitutional law certainly hasn't fallen off the map among criminal practitioners and judges who deal with criminal matters uh, without um, being afraid to take the risk of perhaps uh, degenerating into hyperbole, the impact of the charter and the criminal law has been absolutely momentous. I think back to when my career began, I became a professor in 1981, just as the charter was starting to have an impact. And at that time, the expectation was that probably not much was gonna happen. And we had the experience of the Canadian Bill of Rights but it didn't take long to see that we were revolutionizing the way that we adjudicate criminal cases and the way we broker the rights of the state and the right of individuals. I think that to really understand the impact of the Charter, we have to think not only about the direct implications of the Charter on the law and on the culture of the law, but the indirect implications as well. The direct implications were obvious from the very beginning when I started, there was no interest in police illegality at a criminal trial. That's a matter for another day. You go and bring a lawsuit, you bring a complaint to police services board, uh, 
but it had nothing to do with the guilt of the accused. Well, now, of course, the charter challenge is the ubiquitous part of many criminal cases. It's, it's quite routine to see charter applications brought alleging violations by the state of rights that were not even known at the time. The rights that were described in the Canadian Bill of Rights Act look something like charter rights, but ultimately they were relatively toothless. It was treated as an interpretive statute. It didn't have the kind of impact that the charter had. We've seen wholesale changes to the law of evidence, predominantly through 24.2 and the exclusion of unconstitutionally obtained evidence. But we uh, also have reinvigorated the right to silence relative to what it was at the time in question. You could draw adverse inferences against someone for not testifying when I started my practice. The uh, changes in criminal procedure have been dramatic. We didn't have a right to trial within a reasonable time. Uh, you didn't have uh, any restriction on the creation of reverse onus provisions where the accused has to prove facts in order to support a reasonable doubt or raise uh, a doubt about the, their guilt and to challenge a proposition in the Grounds case. And now those things uh, are heavily vetted using the charter. But um, there have been changes to, to the criminal procedure and jury selection. Uh, it, it just goes on and on and on. And I know we'll talk a little more later about the substantive law changes that the Charter has brought. But I just want to say a few words before we move on about the indirect implications that the Charter has had for the law. I think that it had a profound effect even on the way we interpret statutes. We didn't talk a lot about purpose of interpretation back in 1981. That was a concept that really picked up its legs in the context of constitutional adjudication and gradually spread out to the point where it influences virtually every decision we make in statutory interpretation now. We just read the law differently because of the charter. Uh, we've refined the law of judicial notice. Nobody spoke about social context information in, in the old days. It just didn't happen. We've got race-based challenges for cause. Uh, we've really we created the concept of a stay as a vital part of the criminal laws in which the judge orders the crown not to proceed with the case it was it's such an underdeveloped notion before the charter and th those underlying concepts see what's happened is the charters made us have a really profound dialogue about what the basic principles of criminal law are and we've seen seismic shifts as the criminal law charter-based decisions have matured. The concept of reasonable suspicion as a basis for conducting an investigation that constitutes a search or seizure was unheard of. It was only when we made, we set a fairly high standard for charter searches in the early days of the charter that parliament responded by coming up with a less intensive standard of scrutiny for types of warrants that didn't affect the invasion of privacy to the same degree. The reasonable suspicion standard is a child of the charter. I think the same holds true with the concept of penal negligence. In the old days, we had a hard time accepting that you could criminalize somebody for negligent behavior. And we had all kinds of myths that we used to suggest we were looking for mens rea and we were finding it in the failure to consider things or in the absence of care and absence of thought and calling it mens rea. We didn't do that anymore because the charter required us to engage in a significant dialogue about what is the proper reach of the state in criminalizing conduct and where does moral fault start? And we've arrived at the point where we now accept objective fault, provided it's bad enough. And we call that penal negligence. We saw it with the development of the reasonable steps requirements in the uh, criminal code that require individuals, if they're going to raise certain defenses, to have taken reasonable steps to inform themselves. That wasn't there before the Charter. So I, it's really difficult to uh, exaggerate the impact that the Charter has had on the criminal law. It's been momentous, and although the impact of the, criminal, the Charter on the criminal law may fall off the radar, uh, among some constitutional scholars who have dedicated themselves to fundamental freedoms and equality and other related issues, I can tell you that in the criminal law trenches, this is a force to be reckoned with. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so much, David. Um, let's move on a little bit to, to that substantive portion of, of, um, of criminal law. Uh, and we've had a lot of discussion over the last two days around history. And so I just, if you'll 
indulge me, I, I think it's fair to note that the framers of the charter had certain expectations, it seems, of how it would apply uh, in the criminal justice context. And I'm thinking, for example, of their narrow and largely procedural view of Section 7, and in particular, the term, the principles of fundamental justice. But in its very first decision on Section 7, of course, the Supreme Court of Canada concluded that the term fundamental justice extends to includes much more than procedure. It, of course, does guarantee that, but not just that. And uh, that set a theoretical framework that then uh, was, was uh, fulfilled in a number of cases that came to uh, impose a, a fairly significant limit on Parliament's power to create offences. What do you think were some of the factors that, that convinced the court or persuaded it that it was right to take that step? That, that's a, a really fine question. And I think the short answer to your question with respect to substantive due process, as we used to call it, is that our court tried very hard to look for objective guidance in the interpretation of the charter. And the criminal law is rich with principles and ideas about what is fundamental and what is fair. And when you're invited to look at the impact of principles that are fundamental to justice and how they impact on liberty and security of the person in particular, those principles jump out. And it is impossible to deny if you take a scholarly approach to identifying those principles that are fundamental to justice to confine it to procedural principles. At least that was the reasoning that the court engaged in. But it's such a great question because there's lots going on here. Historians debate over whether historical events arise because of uh, great people or forces that are beyond those individuals. I think that at the time the charter was first making its way to the Supreme Court, the right mix of people were there to give the charter the life that it now has. If we had had a different assembly of judges, the charter might have been stillborn relative to the vital document that we currently have. Justice Dixon, later Justice Lemaire, Justice Wilson, Justice Laferre, these were people who had a strong understanding of the basic principles and were prepared to take the invitation that had been extended to the courts by the government of Canada and most of the provinces and recognize that if the rule of law is to be respected, it includes the rule of law that's identified in the charter. Now the task is where do we go with it? What do we do with it? No question, those were optimistic years. We were still at the optimistic stage where we thought change was going to continue to occur, that it was going to be positive change. And I think you give a tool like this uh, to the judiciary and they have for many years felt that they may not have the tools needed to produce what is fundamental to justice. It's not a surprise with the benefit of hindsight that it was taken up. But I think the personalities had a lot to do with it. And I'm not suggesting these were fully political choices. Ultimately, a careful examination of those basic criminal law principles that would be the guideposts in any legitimate exercise of legal reasoning really pushed in the direction that the charter ultimately went. The two key principles that developed, I think, that really moved this on were first the idea that the, the charter itself is a living tree. And that enabled uh, justices like Justice Laferre to say when faced with statements made in the House of Commons that the charter has nothing to do with abortion, to say, well, this charter contains concepts, not conceptions. And that may be the particular minister's conception of what the charter carries, but we're here as guardians of the fundamental concepts that underlie the charter. In addition, the purpose of interpretation, critically important because the language of the charter is, um, is vague at times, and to really make a coherent decision, you need to get to the heart of the issue that the charter is addressing. 
And as we identified those issues, we developed a, a large number of guideposts that can be used ultimately to make the decisions. So it was a combination of the people, it was a combination of the times, but it, it was primarily in the criminal law context, an inevitable outcome of the basic principles that were already identified within the criminal law, but were restricted in the application that they could have. What this charter has done is really liberated those principles in a way that enabled what we now call uh, fundamental or, or substantive due process, where a judge can look at principles about what the law says rather than simply the procedure with which the law is implemented. Thank you. It's, it's such a great point about, and it's humbling to think how much of our constitutional jurisprudence and norms rest on really contingent factors, right? Who is deciding? Who is in place? Who who are the, what are the relationships, the dynamics among those, those people? So you, you've said it's difficult to exaggerate uh, the importance of the Charter. And, and of course, you've talked a, a lot about its, its procedural, um, its effect on, on procedure. Just sticking with um, substantive criminal law, uh, there are those who say that it's it, certainly in, in more recent years, the effect has not been as, as great as the potential appeared to be in, in the early formative years of the Charter. Um, with respect to substantive criminal law, um, the arguments made that in recent cases, it's really more ordinary interpretive tools that have have um, uh, had the greatest impact and, and citing cases like ADH, Zora, and that some of the most significant recent charter victories struck down laws on the basis of um, so-called instrumental rationality with the implicit suggestion being that Parliament is free to recriminalize certain conduct if it just articulates a different or slightly tweaked objective. Um, it, it, is there anything to those arguments uh, that perhaps we can sometimes uh, be a little romantic or a little over too sweeping in, in how we evaluate the, the Charter's true impact on substantive criminal law? I think there may be something to the observation. Uh, the history of the development of the charter rights and their interpretation and the tools has been one of getting caught up in a flourish and going far enough that you scare yourself and you have to take a step back. And, and there may be a little bit of that going on, but I, I don't accept the basic principle that the move towards instrument, uh, instrumental rationality uh, has really denuded the charter of its substantive impact. The history has not been eradicated. The early cases were kind of low hanging fruit, really. And when we look at the demise of constructive murder where somebody could be convicted of the offense of murder without intending to kill, uh, you know, we, we used substantive due process to say that we have a fundamental principle that requires subjective fault in this context. Uh, we did the same with respect to um, statutes that purported to remove the need to inquire into whether the accused understood the age of the victim in cases involving sexual offenses where there's immaturity of the victim at stake. Um, we developed uh, the concept of penal negligence using the charter, uh, and it has uh, had a, a profound effect on the law and, and how we interpret it. Uh, fundamental freedoms to... Uh, to broker the extent to which we can deal with things like hate crimes. I know a controversial example, but nonetheless, one that remains uh, remains with us. Um, and most dramatically, uh, the, the constitutional eradication of the crime of abortion. And I think one of the things that illustrates to, to me is that even procedural rights can have substantive manifestations. Uh, if you read Morgenthaler and you, you line up the judges and you try to figure out the ratio of that case, there's a good argument to be made that all it stands for is that the abortion statute was unconstitutional at the time because there was not access to the abortion committees and therefore the defense was illusory. And that's how Justice Dixon evaluated it and that's effectively what most people signed on to. That's the lowest common denominator in the decision. But before long, everybody knows that that case evolved into a profoundly important substantive right. Um, Parliament doesn't have to just be concerned about process in, in how it defines these matters. In order to um, 
protect substantive rights, this, these processes and the restrictions that they impose can have a profound effect. I mean, think about um, the uh, medically assisted uh, death cases. They ultimately are protecting the right of choice that exists with respect to making profound decisions about one's physical continuation and, and one's health. Uh, we can talk about it in terms of it's too broad, it's uh, it's arbitrary, and that's how we analyze it. But ultimately, that's what we're protecting. We're saying if you're going to go into this area, do as little damage as possible. So it's not like there isn't a substantive right that is at the core of that body of authority. Um, I, I think that the substantive law continues to be affected. We've developed all kinds of interpretive rules for the criminal law that actually protect substantive interests. We presume mens rea with respect to every element of the offense, unless there's an indication to the contrary. We assume that Parliament doesn't intend objective fault unless it's crystal clear. And when Parliament speaks of, uh, in the language of negligence, we interpret it to mean penal negligence. Those are all constitutional limits on the stand of law that operate on a daily basis. Yes, I've always uh, interpreted Morgenthaler as primarily a case about arbitrariness, really, even though it's not explicitly stated. But uh, it's true, isn't it? And, you know, I was thinking even Section 276 in the Seaboyer Challenge, it was cast as a right to full answer and defense case. But ultimately, it was about overbreadth, the, the limits on when questions could be asked that expose the sexual experience of a complainant were too rich, restrictive. Uh, and, and that's really what that case was about. And I, I think it, it's a different way of framing the issue at times, but it, it's it's not ignoring the underlying substantive interests. Right. So you've made some comments in this the general area of this next question. Uh, one issue that has um, emerged as a point of debate in in areas other than criminal law is the role of charter values. So we've had it in in procedural cases, and certainly in administrative law. Um, is there room for charter values in criminal law jurisprudence and, and the application of, uh, for, for example, the interpretation of offenses, or is it all really subsumed in the existing enumerated rights? No, I think that uh, charter values, although not articulated as such, uh, are omnipresent in the daily operation of the criminal law. It's imbued everything we do. Uh, I've, I've given some examples already of how our statutory interpretation rules really reflect charter values uh, and, and not just the traditional methods of charter interpretation or statutory interpretation that were once used. I mean, th think about the impact that the charter has had indirectly. Without question, on the ground, the most profoundly important decision in the criminal law area in my lifetime has been the Crown and Stinchcomb, which gives the accused a right to disclosure of relevant information gathered by the police and available to the Crown, subject to modest limits. And that's not a charter case. Stinchcomb is based on the common law, but you can bet that prior to the charter maturing and having a big impact on basic conceptions of fundamental justice and full answer and defense, we never would have had disclosure develop as a common law rule as vibrantly as it did and as early as it did. So it's just that it's an illustration of how these charter values almost at a subterranean level come into the development of the law. Same thing with the stay of proceedings and the maturation of that remedy for charter violations. It's actually a common law body of law and we only use the charter stay uh, in, in exceptional cases, but we wouldn't have this developed concept of a state if it wasn't for the charter. So those are examples of the charter values uh, influencing it. And as I've already mentioned, the presumption of subjective mens rea, all these other things that affect how we broker the criminal law really reflect fundamental ideas that are borrowed from the charter. And we can call them charter values if you want. I, I get that we're really reluctant to let courts start to grab vaguer, not really present rights and call them charter values and expand the charter in that way. I get it. But we can never believe that the values of the charter are not always operating at some level within the system. 
So I'd like to switch tack a little bit and, and move to um, a question around the, the, the process of constitutional litigation, uh, which the charter, of course, to which the charter spawned an entirely distinct approach. I'm thinking of uh, uh, evolutions in the law of standing and uh, the role played by interveners, which when you step back to think about it, the idea that you would have uh, third party interveners, not added party, but third party interveners in cases that emerged initially as criminal matters is really a very striking idea. And I just wanted to invite you to, to give some thoughts about what is the uh, role of interveners in these cases. And if you would, perhaps with some attention to the role of attorneys general who, who, inter who intervene in cases as opposed to defend against them. Sure. Um... The, the, the starting point, of course, is that interveners never talk about the guilt of the accused in the context of a criminal intervention. And they're not there to assist in the factual determinations that have to be made or in answering questions of mixed fact and law. How does the evidence fit this rule? They're brought in in cases where there is a broad legal point that is going to go well beyond the case and they're confined in the submissions they make to those issues. And interveners can play a significant role. Uh, we have received tremendous assistance, for example, from the Criminal Lawyers Association and Criminal Appeals, in part because when you have a sophisticated intervention, it's usually from a well-organized group, and they tend to hire very skilled lawyers who can come in and provide tremendous assistance to the court. Many of these issues take a lifetime of study and your typical street lawyer will understand enough to make the case with respect to the particular challenge. But when you bring in a broader array of really strong litigators, you get much more assistance as a court. Uh, the other factor of course, is that we still have largely an adversarial model for resolving issues. And to have somebody put a position at its strongest is tremendously helpful. And interveners often come from groups that have an interest in the particular position that they're advancing. And like everybody, like all of us, you, you believe to an extent what you wanna believe and you believe it vigorously and you believe it honestly, and you come in and you make the strongest arguments you can make. So it can really enrich things. Now, with respect to attorneys general from other provinces, sometimes there are legitimate regional differences that have to be taken into account. And often, um, because of the complexity of a lot of these issues, you, you put more heads together, you get a better result. But yeah, you got to be really careful because you can't line up nine prosecutors on one side of the room all arguing in favor of a position against one or two people who are trying to give the other side of the constitutional debate. Um, so that, that's the responsibility of the courts, though, when granting leave to intervene. We've got to take into account how best to balance the interests at stake and how to confine the interveners to their legitimate context. But I, I think the development of interventions, even in criminal cases, can be a, a very worthwhile uh, development and, and something that um, has improved the law that we have. Sticking with the more general idea of process, um, in, in a number of your decisions, you've taken great care to detail the particular circumstances faced by uh, disadvantaged defendants in particular. And I just wondered, like, how important is this kind of information in a charter analysis of criminal law? And how hard can it be to, to come by? Um, in answer to the first question, it couldn't be more important. Uh, it, it's, it's urgent because the law is not an abstract thing. It affects the lives of real people and the charter decisions that are made uh, have an impact that uh, has to be appreciated before uh, an appropriate decision can be arrived at. Um, it affects people in very dramatic ways. And you cannot, I think, adjudicate these issues in the abstract. It's no secret that one of the primary objectives of the charter is to uh, 
uh, address disadvantage. Um, and as a result, it's important to make that tool available and, and to, to consider what its impact is going to be on, on those groups. All we have to do to really understand this, I don't think it's too hard to come by the information. All you have to do is go into court and watch cases. And I'm not talking about the high profile cases. Walk into a provincial court where we have the lower level prosecutions going on many times a day. Those courts handle over 95% of all criminal matters in Canada. It's easy to forget that, but most of those cases involve fairly low level charges, but the courts are full of people who are persons of color, indigenous people, mentally ill individuals, uh, those really in many cases who are desperate. They're in such poverty, they feel they have little to lose. It's not hard. You'd have to be blind not to see if you're actually in those institutions. Those of us at the appellate level, we can lose touch because we don't see that on a daily basis. But there's, a, a I think, a, a real maturity in, in our, our judiciary these days about making sure we, we understand the impact of what we're doing and, and the concepts of judicial notice and taking things into account. We're, we're no longer as afraid as, as we once were. So the information you need to really understand the urgency of the charter exercise is there. All you have to do is open your eyes and see it. So before we, we turn to, to questions and turn it back to, to Stephen, um, this question is a little bit more directed at, at you personally, which is just to note what a remarkably varied career you've had as a defense lawyer, as an academic and author, and now as, as a jurist. And a, your career also tracks much of the time period that, that we've been talking about in, in terms of the Charter's arrival uh, in both substantive and procedural criminal law. And I just was just wondering if your perspective on it and its legacy has shifted as you've moved from one role to the next? Uh, in, undoubtedly, but sometimes the last person to really see what, if, an, a, what an impact experiences have had on them is the person who's having those experiences. And none of us like to recognize that we used to be wrong. Uh, so, uh, so we don't usually always track the developments, but I, I, I have had a very fortunate career. I, I started as a legal academic and that's all I did for the first six years of my career. And I, I credit that with, I, with giving me a real commitment to the rule of law and a real commitment to the long-term interests of the administration of justice. As a professor, you're not burdened with the weight of your client's interests. And you can look at the longer term interests of, of the rule and society and how it's affected. And you can get a strong understanding of the systemic principles that underscore the law. Uh, it's a, the, the luxury of reflection that, that you have, and I know Steve has, it's such an enriching thing. It, it gave me, I think, a real platform upon which to understand the law in a way that gives you reverence for the institution an acceptance of the role that everybody plays within it and familiarity with the basic principles. Uh, I stepped into a prosecutor's role for six years. I, I prosecuted one day a week and all summers long and every chance I got while I was teaching full time, you know, for, for many years. And, and uh, I, I obviously that's a sobering experience. You, you really, I think, appreciate the importance of taking a realistic approach to the charter and the objectives of, of trying to ensure that justice is done not only to the constitutional rights of the accused, but also to society as, an, as, as a whole, and that the prosecutions don't become uh, farcical because of an obsession with charter rights. It's a, it's a perspective that I think is sobering, uh, and, and I think it, it grounded me to a degree. And then I moved to doing defense work while teaching and, and that was such an enriching experience, but of course your focus is on your clients at that point. And I had some interesting experiences, including uh, participating in a case that uh, struck down a section of the Security of Information Act, the old Official Secrets Act, and, and um, halting the extradition of the first person put on Canada's uh, a terrorist list um, when it was done purely arbitrary and for political reasons. 
uh, it's, you know, participating in, in uh, cases as an intervener and, and being there to contribute to the disclosure um, jurisprudence for, for criminal defense lawyers when there was no right to disclosure prior to that. It was just all so enriching and, and gave me a respect for the potential that the charter has. And now as a judge, obviously I have huge institutional and societal responsibilities to make sure that we respect the legitimacy of the reasoning process we're engaged in and resist any urge to try to make the law in our own image. Uh, we're all human, we're all attracted to outcomes, but we need to be able to ground our decisions in legalistic thinking. Otherwise, there's no legitimacy in the exercise that we're engaged in. There's no law, there's only power. So as a judge, you're really cognizant of that. Uh, and, and it's just being able to watch the whole package of, of the criminal law from different perspectives has, has really been enriching for me. I think that's a great place maybe to, to turn it turn it back to Steve. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. It's my pleasure. Thank you. That was uh, very uh, illuminating and enriching, uh, Justice Pachaco. Um, so maybe uh, I'll ask a, a question. Uh, apologies if it's a bit long-winded, but I think it, it follows from some of the, the questions that Carissa posed. And you mentioned, I think, early on that you see the role of the courts as being to interpret and apply sort of fundamental concepts kind of inhering in the charter. And, and I would suggest, uh, and you may or may not agree, that these concepts are, are fundamentally liberal in nature, uh, at least in the sense that they're designed primarily to protect individual rights against you know, state overreach and uh, majoritarian oppression. So I'm wondering what thoughts you might have on the limits, if any, of this approach. And at what point, in other words, do courts kind of risk losing their legitimacy if they venture too far away from what we might call consensus communitarian norms? And for example, I happen to agree with the Ontario Court of Appeal in a decision written by a certain someone that section 33.1 of the criminal code, which takes away the extreme intoxication defense for many violent offenses like sexual assault is unconstitutional. But that position, as far as I can tell, is pretty controversial and arguably not very popular with a, a lot of Canadians. So how do you sort of reconcile or approach making these kinds of decisions that may push up against these kinds of majority norms or, or preferences? I think in a loose way, but only in a loose way, it is important to stay cognizant of how the law is being received. I've always believed that the only thing that makes the law work ultimately is not the power to impose, but it's general consensus that that is the law and the institutions are respected and people comply because they agree. So if you push too far, of course, you're going to lose credibility. At the same time, uh, it's important to understand that the majority and the government don't need a charter to be able to accomplish their objectives. Uh, and the legal rights provisions in the criminal code in particular are all rights that are designed to give to those whose liberty is at stake against the power of the state, uh, the, the protections that fundamental justice is perceived to require. Mm -hmm. uh, that being so, and, and realizing that often when things are looked at in the abstract, we have one opinion, but when we get close to it, we have another. No judge can be afraid to do what they believe to be the legally required thing by using the techniques of statutory construction, constitutional construction, uh, and precedent to try and make sense of the law and hold it as, as, as a, a unified body of information. You, you, you just can't. Um, you know, I, I've had experiences as a criminal defense lawyer uh, representing individuals who were strong and public advocates for get tough on crime. I can tell you when they were charged, they had very different perspectives on what the criminal justice system looked like. Uh, a, a judge can't get swayed by a generalized opinion when the concrete facts of the case and the specific law that they're dealing with points them in a direction. This is not a popularity contest. Um, and I understand that, it, you know, there's, there's constantly going to be critiques of the decisions that are made. And, and that's healthy within a democracy and it's right. But 
we have to be basing our decisions on what we understand the law to be. All right, we have time for uh, one more question and maybe I'll pose it to, to both of you because I think it uh, sort of overlaps with a lot of, of what's been discussed already and perhaps follows from the last question. And that's with respect to the, you know, the so-called dialogue approach or dialogue model to constitutional interpretation and the specific relationship between the courts, especially the, the higher courts and, and parliament. Um, do you see that, that model uh, as being useful as being productive, or is it a bit of a, a dodge in terms of avoiding the ultimate responsibility of the courts to interpret the charter, you know, under the authority of Section 52 of the Constitution Act uh, 82 to, to make fundamental decisions uh, about, you know, about individual rights and, and the rule of law? Uh, it, it depends how we conceive of the uh, concept of dialogue. Clearly, uh, the, the charter decisions have uh, modified and developed over time and as a result of the experiences on the ground when there's a change in circumstances, additional information that's brought forward or new innovations tried like the reasonable steps requirements or reasonable suspicion. Uh, that's, a, that's a form of dialogue. That's parliament responding to the limits that the uh, court is imposing by saying we're going to try this a different way. And those ways have borne fruit and that's a healthy dialogue. But those who conceptualize dialogue as a court makes a determination that something is unconstitutional and that the, the court is saying, this is as far as you can go. And for the court to then be asked to step back and reconsider its position a few months later, that's, that's not dialogue unless there's been a change in circumstances or something that uh, we didn't appreciate at the time the decision was made. And the fact is there's been a lot of evolution and a lot of our, our fundamental ideas. Think about Section 11B. It doesn't look very much now like it has in various iterations. Section 15 keeps changing in terms of how it operates. Section 13, one of the, the self-incrimination provisions, we've interpreted it three different ways. And it's because on the ground, after we, we made our best effort at it, we saw we'd, we'd have, we have problems. And, and the Constitution law is capable of responding, and that's in part because of input and dialogue. So it's it's not a concept I would reject, um, but it is something that has to be kept in, uh, in check for fear that the legitimacy of a court's proclamation that this is where the constitutional line is becomes meaningless because there's pushback. So um, I, I will maybe take advantage of my uh, professorial position to be a little sharper uh, even and just say, I have never been convinced by the dialogue model in, in charter interpretation, uh, I think it has a number of unfortunate effects. One is that it actually becomes a way for the courts at times to, uh, to shield what are actually quite assertive remedies uh, under the pretense that they are just in a dialogue. Uh, I think that it has perhaps had a really unfortunate effect of cementing uh, the the whole regime of suspended remedies, which I find very problematic for a number of reasons. I do note that the court, the Supreme Court has maybe made some helpful moves in that regard. But the idea being, this is a dialogue. So of course, we're, we should give the legislature time to respond to this declaration that this law is unconstitutional. Uh, I, I find that very problematic. And the other issue I have with dialogue is that it reconceptualizes sections of the charter like section one as a as a mechanism for dialogue when it really should be a, a mechanism for demonstration and evidence and showing why something is a is a reasonable limit but to just get back to your to your, to your question around uh, Stephen around section 33 one thing where I think perhaps we have we, we took a turn early on, that I think is a little unfortunate is that we distorted the relationship between section seven and section one to the point where we all know it, of course, it is rightly difficult to justify a violation of section seven, but there, there can be cases, I think, where the much of the analysis really should be happening under section one instead of being preempted as it often is in section seven. And um, that I think is, is I, I don't really 
see us for coming back from that. There have been a few interesting cases, uh, but that's a turn we took early on. I, I've mentioned the, the contingency in a lot of this, and I wonder if, if that perhaps leads us to, to being in, in a pickle in some of these cases as, as we've seen. Well, you just reminded me of the beauty of having had a varied career. There was a day when I could have said all the things that you just said, and uh, I'm not really poised to, to, to enter into that kind of discussion. Um, so I, I, I heard absolutely everything you had to say, and it was so well said. Well, I think we'll end it there. I'd just like to take the opportunity to extend uh, our appreciation to Justice Pachaco and Professor Mathen for that really stimulating session. It was really great for me to see the criminal law kind of get its due. Um, you know, I think it's beyond dispute that as a practical matter, the charter has had a greater influence in the criminal laws Justice Pachaco discussed than in any other area. So it would have been a shame not to have a, a really a thorough discussion of the influence of the charter and the patriation of the constitution on the criminal law and the criminal justice system. So I thank both of you for that great discussion and We'll end it there. Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.